Well, let's go back to the same chapter we were in this morning, 1 Timothy 3. This time we'll consider in more detail now, verses 8 through 13. And while you're finding that text, let's just bow in prayer for just a moment. Our Father, we come to you once again, eager to be a church that pleases you, eager to be a Christ-honoring church. I pray for every one of our members that they would be eager to be members of a Christ-honoring church and to do their part. I pray for all of our leaders that they would have an ever-growing determination to please the head of the church. I pray for those not yet members who are attending, attending and perhaps considering membership. I pray that they would see our desire and that they would become part of a Christ-honoring church. I pray, Lord, that our efforts to honor you would result in you bringing the lost to salvation, would result in us as a church coming together for ministry that we have yet to even really grasp or understand. And so we ask you, Lord, to bless our time tonight, continue to lay the foundation to help us to be a church that honors our Savior. And we pray in Christ's name, amen. You may remember um, a few messages ago, and I think I brought them up a couple of times, the 6th century missionary to both the Irish and Scotch peoples, uh, Columba. I've really been fascinated by his story. He was known for his preaching, and if you recall, he was known for his singing as well. That, That he would sing even to unbelievers He ministered the gospel to the the crude and ancient picked peoples. And as pagans came to faith in Christ and as Columba trained them in the ways of the Lord, both he and those that ministered alongside him, they came to have a reputation. Here is his reputation. The historian William Blakey describes this reputation. He says this, Never, probably, in these islands was there a body of men whose habits were in such thorough accord with what they preached and taught. In their lives, they were simple, self-denied, self-disciplined. They were ever ready to help when help was needed. They always took side with those who suffered wrong. The sick, the poor, the aged were objects of their most affectionate care. They seemed to have no desire for wealth. No longing for worldly consideration, distinction, or power. Now this is powerful because this group of men in Scotland who converted pagans and planted churches, not only were they spreading the gospel, but they epitomized the character and the humility that really finds great similarity to Scripture's description of deacons in the church. Yes, they were shepherds, but they they had this character quality of taking side with those who suffered wrong, having no desire for the things of this world. We examined eldership in the local church this morning, and you recall that we said that much more is said about the qualifications of elders rather than the details of their functioning. And in the very same way, the church has some latitude and some freedom in how to implement this wonderful layer of leadership, the official servants of the church, the deacons. In some churches, anyone who does anything is titled deacon, and this serves the purpose of elevating the importance of the qualifications really to the whole church, and there's merits to this. In other churches, especially in the Baptist tradition, the title of deacon is most often given to men who in reality function more like elders, so maybe there's a misnaming of the office in those cases. But maybe the greatest Baptist preacher of all time, Charles Spurgeon, While he enjoyed his plurality of elders, he also enjoyed the deacons and he had expectations of them. He expected deacons to function not just as servants in the church, but as purveyors of the gospel, to use whatever ministries they were over as an opportunity to bring the lost to Christ. He was passionate about this. And in still other churches, such as ours, the deacon is more focused on someone who has a specific function, a specific job carrying out the work of the ministry. And so there's a lot of latitude, a lot of freedom how to work this out. But again, the primary emphasis is on character. And so whatever title you want to use, whatever uh, description, whatever uh, way of organizing, character is the main issue. Deacons are important 
because the deacons are the hands and feet of the church, those who lead the other hands and feet into the tasks that are necessary to fulfill the details of the gospel ministry. Or if I could put it this way, it's the deacons that take a church from a few shepherds trying to do everything to a church that's thriving with every member being a a servant at some level, now impacting the community, now impacting the world. The Apostle Paul gives a weighty and a detailed description of the deacons of the church. Let's read together 1 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 8. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not indulging in much wine, not fond of dishonest gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And these men must also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife, leaving their children and their own households well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So here's my plan for the evening. We're going to do kind of three parts. We're going to do the foundation of the office of deacon. We're going to do the qualifications of the deacon. And then we're going to take some time to look at the women servants in the church as addressed in verse 11. So let's look first of all at the foundation of the office of deacon. And I'm going to divide this up with four key words. I'll give them to you up front. These key words are the principle, the position, the proof, and the progression. The principle, the position, the proof, and the progression. For the principle, I want to go away from this text for a moment and go to Acts chapter 6. And this is worth reading. So turn to Acts chapter 6 as we start looking at the foundation of the deacons and what is the principle in play here. Now what we're going to see is that this is not necessarily a direct correlation to the overall practice of deacons in the church, but there are definite similarities which really draw us to one specific principle for Christ's model of leadership in the church, how leadership is supposed to go. And you're familiar with this text, but I think it's worth looking at together. Acts 6 verse 1 Now in those days, while the disciples were multiplying in number, there was grumbling from the Hellenists against the Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not pleasing to God for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this need. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the service of the word. And this word pleased the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they stood before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. These are not just men who can perform tasks. These are not just men who know how to operate an Excel spreadsheet. These are men who are godly, they are men of character. Verse 3, men of good reputation. They're already trusted. They're men full of the Spirit. This means they have a knowledge of the Word of God through which the Spirit works. They're not ignorant of our faith. And they're full of wisdom. They think biblically. They think rationally. They think logically. They're, They're wise men. And you saw also the purpose of these seven men to free the apostles to devote themselves to devote themselves to prayer and to the service or the ministry of the word. That was their purpose. Now, this isn't exactly an exact model for deacons today necessarily, because these men were as much preachers and evangelists as they were servants. We see that throughout the book of Acts. But the similarities are definitely worth noting. Like these seven men, 1 Timothy 3 highlights character over skill. The character was most important. Here in Acts chapter 6, the root Greek word often translated deacon is used three times. Verse 1, verse 2, and verse 4. And those verses is translated as serving and serve and service. So what's the basic principle we can derive? This is it. The principle of spiritual leadership of the church being assisted by other men who carry out functional duties to serve the whole body. In this particular case, the primary duty of the deacons was member care, primarily caring for the widows. And the purpose of their work was to free the shepherds of the church to be about the business of the word, about the business of prayer. 
This is God's chosen method to multiply the efforts of the shepherds in the church. And for me personally, when I hear of pastors mowing the lawn or vacuuming the church or insisting on being at every single meeting that everyone's having in the church, Scripture would say, get more deacons and get to your study and close the door and open your Bible and stop worrying about those little things. Let others do that. Let's go back now to 1 Timothy 3. Let's look now at the position. The position. 1 Timothy 3 begins, deacons likewise. There's a clear parallelism now to the passage immediately preceding concerning the shepherds, the elders of the church. What's the similarity? Overall, the similarity is that there are qualifications to serve. The church is not a free-for-all in which anyone should be able to do anything. The, the old joke is that if you have a heartbeat, you're, you're capable of serving in the church. No, there are qualifications. I think this is also indicative that there is not to be an attitude that someone is condescending to serve the church of Jesus Christ. Quite the opposite. This is the attitude that service is a privilege and is accompanied by character. You know, this happens all the time in the church, hopefully not in our church, but where, where someone is asked to do something and they say, well, I'll, I'll really need to pray about whether it's God's will for me to serve in the church or not. The right answer is, how about I pray about whether to let you serve or not? Because serving God is a privilege. It's not a right. It is an honor. The word deacon itself, basic translation, diakonos, is just servant or minister in the sense of carrying out a task. It's used 29 times in the New Testament and it's used extensively in extra biblical literature as well. In fact, it can speak of someone who is an agent or an intermediary or a messenger or a courier. Now, I want you to keep those ideas in your mind of intermediary or courier because they'll be important later. Josephus, for example, the ancient historian, he wrote of Rachel who brought Jacob to her father Laban as performing the function of a diakonos, an intermediary, an agent. In the more specific sense that Paul has in mind here in 1 Timothy with the office of deacon, it speaks of someone who performs tasks at the request of a superior, someone who assists a leader in carrying out a mission or function. Isn't this the irony of serving in the church? The irony is that the pathway to greatness in the church is humility to be a servant. That's what greatness is. Jesus used the term diakonos this way in Mark 10, 43, when he told his disciples, whoever would be great among you must be your what? Servant. That's the pathway to greatness in the kingdom of Christ. This implies leading with service and with labor. You might have noticed also that in our passage here, this is the longest explanation of the office of deacon in the New Testament Paul doesn't go into a lot of detail as to what a diakonos actually is. He spends all of his time on the character of a diakonos. Why doesn't he go into a lengthy explanation about the role and function of a deacon? I think the best answer is that everyone reading this letter in the early church knew what a deacon was already. This was a common Greco-Roman concept that everyone understood. A diakonos was not strictly a church-related title. It was a title already used in many non-church settings. A diakonos was simply someone commissioned by a superior. He had a certain measure of derived authority. He represented that superior. In similar fashion, the early church father Ignatius in the 1st and 2nd century AD when he ministered, he wrote letters to various churches and he clearly described deacons as assistants to the elders, that that was their job. They were the intermediaries, the assistants. Well, let's look at the proof. The proof asks the question, how do we know someone would be fit for this office? Verse 10, and these men must also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Tested it means examined, approved, just what it sounds like. This testing includes qualifications. You can't determine those without knowing someone well. And it includes a record of service that he is beyond reproach, that, that he has shown over a long period of time that he has a heart to serve. So how does a potential deacon prove himself? Well, simply by doing the work of service for a long time, developing the maturity and the character outlined in this text. The true servant isn't concerned about the title 
He simply yearns to love Christ by loving his church. And if the title gets added, it really shouldn't make that much difference. He's already a faithful servant. Or if I could put it this way, a servant in the church becoming a deacon shouldn't be a stretch. It shouldn't be an eyebrow raiser. It shouldn't be a, really, I had no idea. That shouldn't be the case. There shouldn't be a surprise. It should be a natural question. I actually get asked this question sometimes, and I love this question. How many deacons do we need? Well, here's an answer. How much ministry do you want to do? How effective for the cause of Christ do you want to be? Would you rather row a boat with two men or 20? Would you rather engage Satan, the enemy, with three soldiers or 30? Would you rather serve the needs of the body of Christ with four or 40? I think the answer is obvious. And there is, a, I, I believe, a terrible misconception that as a church has needs, they should add leaders. No, 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 no. The church should qualify leaders so that the, so that the Lord trusts that church with the needs of the community. We raise up as many men as we can. That's the proof. They're tested. They're examined. And here's a progression The progression is found in verse 13. Paul outlines some rewards for serving well as a deacon and it it reveals a development, a progression in someone's life. Verse 13, For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. These rewards are only for those who serve well. There is no record just for time in service. Well, I've been a deacon for 35 years, but you haven't done anything, so that doesn't count. Anyone can fill a chair. Anyone can occupy a position. But what was done with that time? Was he all in? Or was he the invisa deacon that nobody really saw who didn't make an impact at all? So Paul gives the natural result of faithful service and he gives two rewards. The first one we could call a good standing. He calls it a high standing here in the LSB. This speaks of his reputation in the church. He has a reputation of being one who's all in for the gospel, all in for the glory of Christ. And the the form of this verb here, obtaining for themselves a good standing, the form of this verb indicates an ongoing process. There's an emphasis not on service rendered in the past, but on what's going on right now, what they're doing now. I have seen and been a part of even consulting with churches that languish because they have a group of leaders, elders and or deacons, who are kind of resting on the laurels of something really good they all did 15 years ago and trying to ride that. And I think a great question is, what have you done lately? What have you done today? This is a man who gains the standing and the reputation of one who can be counted on, one who is at the ready. He's a pillar in the church because he's available, he's present. If we were to examine the church as a crime scene, that this man's fingerprints are everywhere. His influence is everywhere. The church wouldn't be the same without him. That's the first reward, a good standing. There's a second reward, a growing strength. He said to have great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, the Legacy Standard Bible translators elected to add the definite article, the faith, which is maybe potentially confusing because the faith in the New Testament generally speaks of salvation in Christ and the content of what we believe. But it's simply great boldness in faith that is in Christ Jesus. It speaks of boldness and certainty and conviction. This is the man who has great assurance. He has personal trust in seeing Christ's work in the church. I can put it in a way that makes it very easy to understand. This is a man with stories. This is a man that when someone in the church is filled with fear or trepidation and anxiety, this deacon can say, listen, Let me tell you about the Lord's goodness. Let me tell you about his faithfulness time and time again. And then begins to recount story after story after story of God's help to him and God's help in the church. So that's kind of our our foundation. I'd like to spend some time on the qualifications of the office of deacon. And Paul gives these in verses 8, 9, and 12. And we'll just go in order. Deacons likewise first of all, must be dignified. Dignified. Now, in English, dignity speaks generally of a serious or a composed manner or bearing. It's kind of a serious person. But the Greek term has a much broader flavor to it. 
It speaks of being worthy of respect. It speaks of being honorable. It speaks of moral uprightness. He's dignified. I would point out that this qualification is important enough that it's the qualification of an elder. Verse 4, it's the qualification of serving women in the church in verse 11 and of a deacon as well. What does it mean to be dignified? Well, I want to give you three associations that the New Testament makes with dignity. What does that mean? The first association, dignity indicates age and experience. It indicates age and experience. Now, this doesn't mean that a certain age is necessary to be a deacon, but acting a certain age is. In Titus 2, verse 2, Paul tells Titus that he's to preach or teach the older men to be dignified. Same Greek word. It's surrounded by other admonitions which help us understand Paul's point. They're sober-minded. They're self-controlled. They're sound in faith, sound in love. They're steadfast. In other words, this is a grown-up who is responsible. He's left boyish habits and practices behind. This means knowing when it's time to get down to business, being aware of the weightier matters of life and death. Doesn't mean we can't have fun, but at his core, a deacon is not just a goofball all the time. He knows when it's time to be serious. Here's a second association. Dignity indicates a life of prayer. It indicates a life of prayer. Men who are overly silly and immature all the time are giving away the fact that they have never really wrestled with God in prayer. They're giving this away. According to the previous chapter, 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, men in serious prayer produce something in their lives. They produce peace, they produce quiet, they produce godliness, and they produce dignity because they've been in prayer. The dignified deacon, to put it this way, has scars on his knees from kneeling before God because he's vitally aware that the church and the gospel deal with life and death and with heaven and hell. So he's a man of prayer. That's, di- that's indicated in a life of dignity. Here's a third association. Dignity indicates deep thinking. It indicates deep thinking. Paul tells us in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is dignified, whatever is right, whatever is pure, lovely, commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, consider or think on these things. These are divine things. These are heavenly things. These are lofty things. They're majestic things. They're awe-inspiring things. When Paul says to think on things that are dignified, same Greek word as here in our text in in verse 8, this is the sort of thinking that indicates that a man isn't mired in only the day-to-day concerns of life, but he's also thinking on higher things. His perspective is heavily influenced by his knowledge of the sovereignty of God, his knowledge of the plan of God, the eschatological end times that he's looking to, and he senses an urgency to serve in the church because of those things. And because of this deep thinking nature, he's a spiritual leader, not merely by office, but by example. Those who know him know that he thinks about and he talks about dignified, eternal things. Here's a second qualification. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued. Not double-tongued. Some translations say not gossips, but there's a different Greek word for gossip. Gossip just means to repeat that which is not yours to repeat. But this is a unique word in the New Testament. It's only used here. It's a compound word that means something that you say twice. Something said twice. To say the same thing twice with the intention of communicating two different things on each occasion. To be hypocritical, to be insincere, to be deceitful. There's a flavor of manipulation and intent to this. The negative in front of the word not, it means this can either not say, be not saying one thing while thinking something else, or it can be not saying one thing to one person or a different thing to another. Kind of a classic manipulation tactic. To give you a very light-hearted illustration, when I was in my early 20s and, and freshly married, my mom's uh, husband, who was also my trumpet teacher growing up, that's a weird family tree, I won't even bother you with that, but he, he, he was a great guy. He loved to play golf, and so we're visiting, and my mom came to me, and his name was Cliff, and she said, Cliff really, really wants to play golf with you. I go, oh, all right, I guess we can. And so we're out on the golf course, and I don't know, we're on the fifth or sixth hole or something like this, 
And he's just grumpy. Cliff is grumpy. I said, you know, what's going on? He said, well, I don't really want to be here. Oh, okay. Well, why are you here? And he said, well, your mom said that uh, you really wanted to play golf with me. And so I told him what happened. He said, we're out of here. And so we took off and we were, we were done. That's a lighthearted example. But when men do this in the church to get their way on things, that's damaging. He cannot be double-tongued. He cannot be political. He cannot be self-protective. He cannot be one who crafts his communication, who spins facts to get his way. We have none of that. None of that whatsoever. For all in the church, but especially for the deacons, as indicated by this text, we would think of Ephesians 4.29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. But only such a word is as good for building up what is needed so that it will give grace to those who hear. Unwholesome word, corrupting talk, the ESV says. It's a word that means something that's rotten, something that's spoiled. It's been corrupted. It's been diseased. The idea here of being double-tongued goes beyond just gossip because you're not self-disciplined or self-aware. There's a motive. There's a heart behind it. There's a purpose. There's an intention. This falls much more into the category of Proverbs 11.3 that the integrity of the upright will lead them, but the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. Now, why would this particular warning, this particular qualification of not being double-tongued be given to deacons? Remember that deacon... This word and the office and the idea carries, at least in part, the idea of being messengers, of being couriers, of being representatives. In large part, the deacons represent the elders to the church, and they represent the church to the elders. And so being double-tongued in any way is completely out of the spirit of sacrificial service for the sake of the gospel as a courier, a messenger from the elders to the church and vice versa. And so a deacon who's upright in speech is a must-have in the church of Jesus Christ. There's another qualification. Not indulging in much wine. Not indulging in much wine. This isn't a prohibition against drinking, drinking alcohol, but keep in mind two historical facts. First of all, the wine of the first century world was many times weaker in alcohol content than its modern counterpart. Many times weaker And the second fact is one of the functions of wine was to act as a concentrate which was mixed with water to at least in part purify the drinking water in a world where finding pure water was pretty hard to do. And we can prove very easily that the wine of the ancient world was way weaker than what we have today. The, the, uh, The Passover and the Last Supper indicates four cups of wine. If Jesus and the disciples had had four full cups of wine by the end, they wouldn't have been able to stand up. And so it's not a prohibition against drinking alcohol, but it is a prohibition against indulging. It's a word that means paying attention to the next drink. Continually thinking about the next drink in terms of craving or need. And of course, the problem with that is this leaves judgment impaired, critically damages his reputation. I have been in church when a man has come to church impaired by alcohol. First, I could see it in his behavior. Second, I could hear it in his words. And third, I could smell it on his breath. Radically disappointing, radically wrong. This is not consistent with the type of man we've described who's dignified, who's a deep thinking man. Instead, he's to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, not by anything else. doesn't mean he's a man without temptations, That he's a man who doesn't willingly succumb to thinking about them all the time. That this is the next time, the next time, the next time. Or to put it this way, he isn't a man who believes he inherently deserves to feed his own pleasure. We don't need any part of that. He isn't constantly pursuing pleasing himself. Speaking of pleasing himself, there's another qualification. Not fond of dishonest gain. This phrase fond of dishonest gain. This is one long word in Greek. It speaks of greediness. It speaks of a a drooling desire to make more and more money. Uh, To be clear, this is not speaking of the ability to make money, but the hard attitude of the love of money. And this can be a major problem for a deacon. uh, There's at least three reasons. I thought of others, but I'll give you three. First of all, this is destructive to the church. It's destructive to the whole church This greediness can act the same way as an addiction to alcohol, an addiction to drugs. 
something you live for, something you think about constantly, something that consumes you. As a pastor, I've seen the love of money come out in this way. We would love for you to serve in some little tiny way. Well, no, as soon as I get X, Y, and Z financially in my life, and then years go by, nothing ever happens. And it's always because there's that one next thing, that one next deal, that one next growing of the business or whatever. And years go by and no service happens. That's love of money. According to 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, greed for wealth causes a temptation, a snare, foolish and harmful desires, ruin, destruction, evil, can even cause someone to wander from faithfulness in Christ. I've had a church member tell me, I I can't go to church here. There's too many demands on on my time. I I need to spend time building my business, so I'm going to go to a church that doesn't ask me to do anything. I praise the Lord he wasn't a deacon. The greedy man cannot think straight about kingdom things. He can't. And certainly has no concept of what it means to trust the Lord for basic necessities. So it's destructive to the church. Here's a a second reason fond of dishonest gain is is a key uh, issue here. A deacon may find himself handling money. Now remember, in the first century church, the church's money was actual money. The people had to watch over. It wasn't just lines in an accounting program or, or a check representing the bank balance. It was actual money. And the temptation for the one who loves money is overwhelming. You remember Judas? John 12, 6 says that he was in charge of the money bag for the disciples and, quote, used to take from it what was put into it. I actually like the ESV. He used to help himself from the money bag. There's a third reason this greediness can be a problem for a deacon It can manifest itself in a desire to be stingy on behalf of the church. To be stingy on behalf of the church. To see the spending of funds for the gospel ministry as something to avoid. That we should be as cheap and as low cost on everything possible. That somehow the goal of the church is to build up a big, big bank account. That's never said in scripture. This is the man who chokes on the double honor requirement of paying preachers generously in 1 Timothy 5, 17. This is the man who is more concerned that the church have money in the bank than reward in heaven. This is the man who believes with all of his heart that one ply toilet paper was ordained by God. This is the man who has luxury items in his home and insists on junk in the church. So love of money has no place in leadership. There's another qualification, and I'm I'm going to compact a whole verse into one phrase. A life demonstrating regeneration. A life demonstrating regeneration. Verse 9. He is to be holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Paul's use of the term mystery is important in Paul's theology. He uses it 21 times in his letters. Basically, it means... The knowledge of God that's beyond the ability of sinful mankind to grasp, but now is graciously revealed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Specifically, when Paul speaks of the mystery, he's speaking of things concerning Christ, concerning the church. Here, when Paul says that the deacon must hold the mystery of the faith, there is a definite article. He's speaking specifically of the content of the gospel, of of what we believe, salvation by by faith alone, in Christ alone, through grace alone. And it must be with a clear conscience. He must have no doubt as to the content of the gospel. He must have no qualms about the truth. But it also speaks of a connection. The connection between faith and life. Faith and practice. That the deacon should have a firm and determined grasp on the gospel and he should be working this out in his life. There isn't a disconnect. And so when Paul says that the deacon must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, he's saying that not only does the deacon have a clear and committed understanding of the gospel, but his life is demonstrating a regenerate nature. He's not living a double life. And so his conscience is clear. It's always disappointing as a pastor, and this has not happened to me in a long time, and I'm so thankful to get a text, a phone call, or an email from someone I've never met who names the name of a church leader and says, just so you're aware, this is what this guy is doing in the community. That he's living a double life. That is crushing. Here's another qualification. And again, I'm going to compact this into one phrase. 
He is an intentional family man. He's an intentional family man. Verse 12, deacons must be husbands of only one wife, leading their children and their households well. First of all, he's the husband of one wife, the one woman man. Like elders, this is not a requirement to be married, but it is a statement of loyalty and fidelity and honor in the marriage relationship. He's faithful to the wife that he has. He's not a man seeking other relationships. He's not a man who habitually has wandering thoughts and eyes. He should be someone who's capable of being tender and kind and loving and a servant to his wife. If he can't do this with her, why would we expect him to be able to do it with the church? And then second, he must lead his children and household well. He must lead. It's a word that means to stand over his home, to be authoritative. He must be the clear leader in his home. His home shouldn't be characterized by, by chaos, by wildness, or the sense that things are out of control. He is to keep his children submissive. They're not wild. They're not uncontrollable. In other words, he's actively training his children to obey. Now, this isn't a demand for perfect children, just like with elders. But it is a demand for a home that isn't chaotic, that's characterized by children who obey and fear their father. That's a must. So if a local church has deacons who are fulfilling these qualifications, what do you get? Well, it contributes to a healthy and a thriving and a Christ-honoring church because not only are they leading, but they're setting an example. They're dignified. They're honorable in their speech. They're not bound up to sinful pleasures. They're not greedy. Their faith is being lived out, and their family life is one worth emulating. Those are godly, godly men. Well, now we come to the issue of the women serving in the church. The New Testament has a rich and vibrant testimony of women who devoted themselves to the service of their Lord. We think of Joanna and Susanna. Luke 8, 3 records that they were wealthy women who provided financially for Jesus and for the apostles as they preached the gospel. Romans 16, 2 tells us that Phoebe was a generous financial supporter of the Apostle Paul. In fact, Phoebe was the one that Paul gave the book of Romans to in Corinth to take to Rome. There are nameless women who set an example, who taught the younger women as exemplified in Titus 2, 3 through 5, the day-to-day faithfulness of godly women who elevated the sanctification of the whole church by training and mentoring the women in the church. We think of the women that Paul speaks of in Romans 6, 16, rather, who worked hard for the Lord for the ministry of the gospel, Mary and Tryphena and Tryphosa, Persis. They're the women who showed compassion and care in the ministry, Mary Magdalene, the women with her who helped care for the basic needs of Jesus and his men in Mark 15. We meet the Samaritan woman who met Jesus at the well in John 4, who was the first to bring the gospel of Christ to her own hometown, to her own family, And she saw many people come to faith in Christ because of her faithfulness. There are the disciple-making women who spread and explained the Word of God in whatever sphere of influence they had. We mentioned this morning, Anna the prophetess was evangelizing all the people who had come to the temple when Jesus was an infant in Luke 2. Timothy received Bible training at the feet of his mother and grandmother. 2 Timothy 3.15 tells us this. This set him up to be a preacher by the time he was probably 20 years old. Priscilla privately helped Apollos, the great preacher, know the way of God more accurately, Acts 18.26. And there are women who suffered for the sake of the gospel. Priscilla and her husband Aquila, Romans 16.3 and 4, says they risk their necks for the gospel. They risk being beheaded. That's where we get that phrase, risking your neck. They risk being beheaded for promoting the good news of Jesus Christ and His death and His resurrection. In Romans 16, 7, Paul mentions a woman named Junia who was well known among the apostles because she was imprisoned along with Paul for the gospel. Euodia and Syntyche and Philippi were called by Paul the honored term fellow workers. In this case, meaning those who evangelized the lost. Lydia, who was from Thyatira but saved in Philippi, she prevailed upon Paul and his companions to stay with her in her large home and she likely hosted the very first church gathering in Philippi as well. And we also think about in the early church the countless younger women who went against the feminist culture of the Greco-Roman world 
And they obeyed Paul's admonition that young mothers are to be busy at home, loving their husbands, loving their children from Titus 2, resulting in children getting saved, marriages and families that were now strong and strengthened the church. The church of Jesus Christ is not just enriched by the women of the church. The women of the church are the ligaments and the joints and the marrow of the church. The women who yearn for the good news of the forgiveness offered in Christ to be spread to the community and to the world and who make the ministry of the shepherds infinitely more multiplied and effective. And so that brings us then to verse 11. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. So there's two basic questions we have to address. First of all, who are these women? And second, what is the extent of their authority? First question, who are they? The basic debate is around whether or not, as the English Standard Version and many other English translations render this, whether they are deacons' wives. Many translations say their wives, likewise, must be dignified. Or are they women in the church? Now, why is there a debate? Well, the the main reason for the debate is that the Greek word translated wives can equally be translated women in general. And so it's kind of a photo finish as to which group Paul is speaking of. There are great arguments in favor of this speaking of the wives of deacons. It's not a requirement that wives of deacons must serve, but if they serve alongside their husbands, then they must have these requirements. Here are some of the arguments in favor of that side. Paul gives qualifications of deacons before and after with a kind of parenthesis here mentioning the women that likely Paul is not introducing a whole new class of servant here. If this was a whole new office, we might expect more detail, particularly in light of chapter 2, verse 12, which limits the role of women in terms of authority. We also would see that there's no mention of the marital status of the women, which Paul does do in the other passages where a church office is being spoken of. Verse 2, verse 12, Titus 1, 6. And so the assumption would be here that the women being mentioned are married to the deacons. And so they're placed right here with the deacons. And again, the same Greek word used in verse 12 has the clear meaning of wife. Same Greek word. On the other hand, there are great arguments in favor of this just speaking of women in general who serve in the church, either in some official capacity like a male deacon or in a less official capacity. Here's some of the arguments for that. The use of likewise indicates a third distinct group. This is actually a very strong argument since Paul uses the same term to distinguish particular groups in numerous other places in his epistles. There's nothing in the Greek text such as some sort of possessive their wives to indicate a connection to the deacons. Their wives is, uh, the truth is, it's a decision that translators made. Paul gave no qualification for elders' wives, which would seem to be more imperative So it would be questionable why he would give qualifications for deacons' wives. Now, that argument kind of falls apart a little bit, and here's the reason why. Deacons' wives can help them be deacons. Uh, Elders' wives can't help their elders' husbands be elders. They can't say, well, I'll show up to the meeting and I'll show you guys a thing or two. So there might be a difference there. There's another argument. There's no word for deaconess in biblical Greek. A, A different term, diakonisa, was used for deaconess in the church in post-biblical times, but not in Scripture. And the qualifications parallel those of male deacons. So how do we view this? This is really a photo finish. The debate's very close. That First of all, I don't think it's correct to be very dogmatic one way or the other on this. We have the freedom to exercise some latitude with some logic and some just wise thinking with several facts. Fact number one. Since the standard of qualification to serve has been set and it has precedent other places in the New Testament, we can assume that any woman and any man who serves should be striving for these qualifications. Title doesn't matter. Who you're married to doesn't matter. Speaking of which, a second fact, we've already established that a wide variety of women, some married, some not, serve in the church. And then it's completely reasonable to assume to include in the women servants of the church the wives of deacons who wish to serve alongside them in a support role. So I'm going to land on this being any woman who serves with responsibilities in the church. This may include the subset of deacons' wives. 
but we're going to go with any woman who serves with specific responsibilities in the church. And we'll come back to that idea because there's a, a hotter topic in today's world. What is the extent of their authority? That's the second question. This is where the parallel to deacons is very helpful. We've been clear that deacons do not carry the authority of overseers in regard to teaching and over, uh, authoritative oversight. Paul cannot be contradicting himself from just a few verses earlier. 1 Timothy 2.12 But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. This is not a complicated verse. That first of all, women are not to teach men in the public setting to the whole church. It's not the place of women to instruct Christian men in the church. This, again, has absolutely nothing to do with capability. It has nothing to do with some faulty assumption that women are less knowledgeable than men. That's not the case at all. It's simply God's created order. And then secondly, in chapter 2, verse 12, women are not to have spiritual authority over the men in the church. It's just, it's very simple to understand that. There's never a time for women to be preaching to men or being responsible to shepherd men. Now, does this mean that one woman cannot confront one man about sin? Absolutely not. Priscilla went privately to Apollos and said, hey, there's parts of the gospel you don't know yet, and explained it to him. And the church benefited as a result. And certainly, this is not speaking of functional mundane tasks, which are just part of day-to-day functioning. When some of you ladies are organizing the way the sanctuary is set up for this or that event, and you ask a couple of men, can you move that over there? The men don't get to say, hey, no authority. Nope, not going to do it. No, obviously. And so the ambiguity of this text, it gives us some leeway in applying this to a given local church context. I want to be very clear Neither the deacons or the women servants, whether we choose to call them deaconesses or not, neither of them exercise overall spiritual authority over the church. Otherwise, the church becomes a free-for-all of personal preferences and having more shepherds than sheep. And yes, we expect all servants in the church to exert spiritual example, spiritual influence, but that's a far cry from authority. I mentioned earlier that there's no word for deaconess in biblical Greek and Koine Greek. A different term, diakonisa, was used for deaconess in post-biblical times in the church. The closest we have is, is the form of diakonos, diakonon, which is applied one time to a woman, Phoebe, in Romans 16.1. That's not exactly a precedent. But the early church did, did uh, recognize the office of deaconess. That's why we know that word, diakonisa, as a more official servant in the church. But we don't care about the titles. The titles aren't important. The character is important. So who are the women of verse 11? Women who serve, which may include wives of deacons as a subset. And what's the extent of spiritual authority over the church as a whole? None. That rests in the hands of the elders who are categorically, categorically and exclusively men. Much more importantly, and much more to our focus For the women who serve, particularly in elevated spheres of responsibility, what does God require? What does He require in terms of qualifications? Well, first of all, women must likewise be dignified. We just saw this same qualification for deacons. We identified three associations. Dignity indicates age and experience. It indicates a life of prayer. It indicates deep thinking. But specific to the women in the church and helps our understanding of dignified, Titus 2.3 says that women are to be reverent in behavior. This goes along with dignified. Reverent is what it sounds like. It means holy, devout, pious. It means to act like she's been set apart as holy by her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a, a sense of setting aside those things that are girlish of setting aside the sinful struggles of an earlier time. It's time to be done with struggling with the sin of gossip or struggling with a sharp tongue or those things that might have been more of an issue in her younger years. That there's a time to say, I just need to be done with this. She's concerned with holiness. She's concerned with accurately representing her Savior. She's not having to be told over and over again that she should be reading her Bible or spending time in prayer fellowshipping and serving in the church. These things are part of her life like breathing is part of her life. I'm going to use a word that I think has gone out of style and it's underutilized and I'm going to do my part to try to bring it back. Being dignified as a Christian woman is very related to the concept of having class. Of having class. 
There's an elegance to your faith because you don't panic, you don't fret. You respond to trials in righteous ways. You don't respond to trials with sinful abandon. There's a refinement to your speech. There's a demeanor that you have because the things of heaven, the things of Christ, the things of the church, the things of the cross, the things of salvation, the things of scripture have saturated your heart. And so these are the things upon which you think and these are the things that create reverent behavior, dignity, class. There's a second qualification. Not malicious gossips. Not malicious gossips. This is one of my favorite Greek words. Greek words. It means not a she-devil. It's a feminine form of the Greek word diabolos. Not a devil. She's not diabolical, as we would say in English. She's not a gossip. In, in the New Testament, gossip simply means tail-bearing, whispering, telling something in secret, telling something that's not yours to tell. It has no reference to truth or falsehood. In fact, gossip can mostly be made up of truth, which means that the old Christian myth says that if it's true, it's not gossip, is utterly ridiculous. And it's a disgusting rationalization for acting in a way that Scripture defines as evil. There's also the idea of slander, which is clearly spreading that which is false. Why would this not be in malicious gossips, not being a she-devil, why would this be so important for women who serve? Anyone who serves gets into the bloodstream of the church, gets into the life of the church. And someone introducing slander and gossip into the bloodstream of the church corrupts the whole body. There's a third qualification, temperate. Temperate. This is the same qualification that an elder must have, which means that all men, all women are reaching for this sober-mindedness. That's what temperate means. It refers to having self-control, being level-headed. Your responses are not controlled by emotion. You don't use the excuse, well, this is how I'm feeling, so I'm going to respond in this over-the-top manner. There's a sense of thoughtfulness. There's an ability to have the self-discipline to say, I'd like to think about this and get back to you. She's temperate. Why would this be such an important qualification for a woman serving in the church? Because sober-mindedness, temperance, is what helps you work well with others, especially those in authority. Temperance, sober-mindedness, takes time to consider truth. How about this for a statement of temperance? I'm not sure what I think about that. I'd like to go read my Bible for a week and get back to you. Considers the truth, considers the admonitions of Scripture to act in accordance with what pleases the Lord, not with what pleases me. I think even in the most well-meaning, well-taught, and focused local churches that understand the gospel ministry, the fact that we have to work together can be a challenge. Why is this sober-mindedness, this temperance connected to gospel service? Because Satan has a great strategy. If he can get two, three, or four women not getting along in the church, the elders are completely sidetracked because now we have to deal with that. See also Euodia and Syntyche in Philippians 4. The moment the servants in the church begin thinking of themselves instead of the work of the gospel, the work comes to a halt or at least it's hampered horribly and monumentally. There's a reason that Paul gives Philippians 4 the warning to Yodi and Syntyche and two chapters earlier in Philippians 2 he says consider others as more important than yourselves. That's the solution. I think it's reasonable to ask that when souls hang in the balance we need to be temperate. Not worry about ourselves. Here's a fourth qualification. A woman in the church must be faithful in all things. Faithful in all things. Faithful is a broad word. It can encompass believing the gospel. It can mean believing sound doctrine. It can mean obeying the commands of Christ. It can be responsible, being reliable. She is to be faithful in all things, which means we can include all of those nuances. Specific to being responsible and reliable, this qualification shows the church that she's faithful in whatever responsibilities she's given in the context of serving the church, why? Because she's already shown herself faithful in other areas. This is an idea, the idea of being dependable, being reliable, being someone that people can count on. And so, like the women of old, Joanna and Susanna and Phoebe and Mary Magdalene and Mary of Rome, Tryphena and 
Tryphosa, Persis, the Samaritan woman at the well, Anna, the prophetess, Timothy's mother and grandmother, Priscilla, Euodia, Syntyche, Junia, Lydia. The women of our church can be added to this hall of faith of those women who expended themselves for the sake of Christ. One of my heroes of the faith, and, I, and people say, well, you shouldn't quote Spurgeon too often. I don't think you can spoke, quote Spurgeon often enough. He valued his deacons. He valued the men and the women who served in the church. He, he saw them as a gift from Christ to the church. And he wrote this. Whatever there may be here and there of mistake, infirmity, and even wrong, we are assured from wide and close observation Keep in mind, hundreds of deacons and deaconesses in their church. We can be assured from wide and close observation that the greater number of our deacons are an honor to our faith. And we may style them as the apostle did his brethren, the glory of Christ. Deprive the church of her deacons and she would be bereaved of her most valiant sons. Their loss would be the shaking of the pillars of our spiritual house and would cause a desolation on every side. Thanks be to God, such a calamity is not likely to befall us. For the great head of the church, in mercy to her, will always raise up a succession of faithful men who will use the office well and earn unto themselves a good degree and much boldness in the faith. Well put from our brother Charles. That's my hope for our church. That's my hope for you, for all of us. Toward that end, as we have begun doing occasionally here I'd like to spend just a few moments, seven, eight, nine minutes in prayer together. I think an obvious thing to pray for would be for our deacons and pray for the Lord to raise up others. And from this morning as well, pray for our elders and pray for the Lord to raise up others. See, I I don't want to wait for the Lord to grow the church to have many godly men available. I want to have many godly men available so that the Lord will grow our church. So let's do it as we have grown in the habit of doing and just gather in some groups of three, four, five, six for just seven or eight minutes, and then we'll close with a song. Let's pray together for our leaders.